Hi, everyone. This is Paul Casey, the Kempo Karate Hall of Fame educational video series where we talk about Kempo principles, motion, sometimes about the strategy of Kempo through the art of war, sometimes the art of forms, Kempo style, but it's always, we're always related to Kempo. And we're always grateful for the participants that uh, join us here on these video uh, recordings. And we always encourage everyone to come on and to speak. And today we're lucky to have with us Bob White, Chuck Sullivan, Bob Davison, Jamie Seberg, I see him here, Jason Farnsworth, Joe Rebello, Happy Joe, Michelle Cano, Shane Price, Todd Durgan, and more to join us soon. So with no further ado, today we're gonna to be talking about Mr. Parker's Infinite Insights, Volume 4, Mental and Physical, and we're going to jump on that. <laughs> and let's start with something for Mr. Parker. Let's go right off the bat. He talks about Kempo. He said, it is not the aim of Kempo to merely produce a skillful as well as powerful practitioner, but to create a well-integrated student respectful of all. He also says that Kempo never changes. It is perpetually refined. There is more to be said about these, but I will shake those, save that. That's the first part. Second thing I go to the treatises by Sun Tzu 2,500 years ago. And it's very simple what he has to say in here. He said, Sun Tzu said, the good fighters of old first put themselves beyond the possibility of defeat and then wait for the opportunity of defeating the enemy. Thus, it is that in war that the victorious strategist only seeks battle after the victory has been won, whereas he who is destined to defeat first fights and afterward looks for victory. Some important words there. So these, these references that I have here, they're always related to that. And find the last one here, Miyamoto Musashi. And he has it this way. He looks at, it, take advantage in combat. He says, patience is the only way that you will ever come to understand what the way of the warrior is about. Constantly striving perfection of self through a chosen art is the only path to enlightenment. Words can only bring you to the foot of the path. And to attain the mastery and perfection, you must constantly strive to better yourself through an understanding of your chosen way. One attack only, contemplating winning all your victories with only one strike. We'll be talking about that today. And that is something that is a bone of contention with a lot of our seniors because we see, have a tendency to see a lot of people in a flurry. Uh, are you touching them, as I've been told, or are you striking them? So that's the question. Now, this all premises off Mr. Parker's first book, which is called Out of the Infinite Insights. He looks at it, he calls it the Eight Considerations. And what we have in there is under obviously acceptance, environmental awareness, range, position, maneuvers, targets, natural weapons, natural defenses. So we'll be jumping in on those to ref reference that. But before we go there, I give these references so you can look at them. Let's talk about some of these concepts, the one strike, okay? Let's talk about that, Mr. Sullivan. You are the senior. Why don't you give us an example or what you talk about in your school about ASP? ASP, yes. What is an ASP? It's a uh, oh, yeah. one of the deadliest snakes. Why you qualified that? For a <laughs> ASP. It's I a thought for a second you were saying end. something else. Forgive me. Go ahead. The Go. the ASP is the uh, one of the deadliest snakes known to man. And um, it just worked out for us so beautifully because of the lettering, A-S-P. What are we all striving for in every move we make? Accuracy, speed, and power. And in exactly that order. Because if you're not accurate, what good is a poke in the, in the forehead when it only takes a few pounds of pressure in the eye? Talk about one strike. To me, that's the strike. That is the strike right there to the eye. And if you got glasses on, just show the glasses, the, make, make the glasses do your, do your work for you. 
It used to be you know, never hit a guy with glasses. <laughs> really? Uh-uh. That's your first target. All right. So accuracy, because if you don't hit the hit the spot you're looking for, if you hit heavy muscles or heavy heavy joints, uh, it just isn't going to produce the effect. And of course, the first shot has got to come. That first shot has got to do its job. Otherwise, you're still fighting. Because if you don't interrupt his flow of motion with that first shot, he's got another shot coming. And if you if you hit something inconsequential, that's not that second shot of his could take you out. So accuracy first, speed next. Of course, you got to have speed because if you don't, he just won't be there, or he'll beat you to the punch. And then of course power. Now we have all we all tried to create as much power as we possibly can, and we all know the elements: torque, backup mass, rotational force. Uh, there's, there's half a dozen things that uh, that give us power. And, um, and we use them all because you want to get as much power as you can into your blows. But it's that first shot that really makes a great, great big difference. And if you don't, like Paul said, are you touching or are you hitting? If you go, Bleh! that was three shots. Bop, bop, bop. Bleh! Say it fast. What's it doing? And you go, bop, bop, bop. what is that? Bop, bop, bop. Uh-uh. Bop, bop. I mean, it, uh, you, you got to make that first shot count. Are we lost? Have we focused too much on speed? I think we have uh, in, in, many, in many cases, yeah. That's why I love having a dummy that you can use and because when I'm, when I'm judging my, my students, uh, a lot of times I use a whistle. And if they're hitting the dummy and they go, pop, 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 I'll go, and they, they go like, okay, well, they know what it means. That means he didn't hit him. Or sometimes they'll actually, they will actually do it like they're doing it on a, a workout partner. They'll come close, but not hit. Now there's, of course, I have a few stories about that, but I, I can't even get into it right now because they're too long. But you, you gotta be hitting. And when you're practicing, now if you have to, you gotta put gloves on in order to, in order to really get, be able to do it because I've got a knuckle here that won't allow me to hit much of anything. You can use a heel palm instead because I did this to myself years ago and um, that's another story. But anyway, you, you've got to hit and you've got to be able to see it and hear it and feel it. You can almost feel it in the room when the, when the impact is there. And that's, it's, um, the old man used to say, to, to hear is to disbelieve, to see is to be deceived, feeling is believing. Okay. And if we can't hit each other and know that we're hitting, know that you're actually making that contact, then the best thing you can do is, is have yourself a life-size dummy, even if you have to build your own, because unfortunately, Century Bob is just, it's its a big toy. <laughs> You're cruel. <laughs> I am. <laughs> build your own, for God's sake. The plans are on our website. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. Own. You told me to get rid of that one, and I call him the I'm perfect. Sorry, just, I'm sorry. I call him the perfect dummy. It was cheap. Okay. <laughs> Eat the living, and what the heck. You know, before we go, I'm going to go over to Todd Durgan in a second. In Infinite Insights number one, okay, uh, Mr. Parker has it laid out in, uh, under chapter 10. He goes into what he considered prompting and categorizing the basic elements. And there's a purpose for this. It's I'm setting foundation. Just like with my quoting uh, of the authors that I have in here, I'm going to read this off and then go to Todd. So he has them here. Now, he basically laid it out one through eight as stances, blocks, parries, punches, strikes, finger techniques, kicks, foot maneuvers. Personally, I think stances and foot maneuvers should be one, two, or A, B, or together because they seem to be more related to one another. It's a foundational thing. Uh, with that being the case, Mr. Durgan, as you heard uh, Mr. Sullivan say, let's talk about that. What are, we, what are we doing wrong here? Are we not setting up our foundation correctly? Is that the problem? Yeah, well, so it depends, I guess, if you're looking at a commercial model or a, uh, uh, you know, a garage studio. And it really goes back to what the intent and the understanding of the instructor or the teacher is. But it, as a whole, what you see uh, you know, in the masses is yes, we're, we're missing foundational properties in our, in our, maybe not in our teaching, but certainly in our practice. Right. 
So you can teach, <clears throat> I mean, you can teach two plus two all day, but until the student practices and understands it and applies it to, to, you know, how to get to four and how to get to six and how to get to the next step, until they're practicing it and doing it, uh, you know, it, it, what you teach them doesn't matter. Uh, you know, it's funny, I, I enjoy Mr. Uh, Sullivan, and I only call him Mr. Sullivan because I know he, pre he prefers Mr. instead of Grandmaster or Sir or all of that other stuff. Um, no, just Chuck. I appreciate, <laughs> right, yeah. Well, Mr. <laughs> Sullivan, uh, I appreciate his, uh, <clears throat> that's, that's a respect, <laughs> sir, and that's going to continue for the rest of my life, <laughs> just like Mr. White and uh, all of the other seniors to me for sure anyway um the asp is it, it's fun to listen to uh, other people's interpretation and understanding or preference of those elements um, i personally uh use uh, acronym taps you know they play at everybody's funeral right in the military <laughs> it's taps okay so taps and for me so for me i have it organized a little differently however the application can change. I, I have it organized for the for the purpose of practice, not for the necessarily for the purpose of uh, uh, for the purpose of practice and understanding of the importance of these elements: timing, accuracy, power, and speed. Uh, and and in the order of importance of uh, you know how am I working on and what am I going to deliver? Um, and then on the other side of that is target, aim position and synchronization. So that's why speed is kind of, you know, really need to work on understanding what speed is about. And I came to the, all this years and years ago when I uh, did a little demo at a big belt test and uh, I, I went beyond my capacity to move properly uh, and got in the car with Mr. Rainey and he turned around and looked at me and he says, what the hell was that? I said, what? He said, dude, you need to slow down. I said, yeah, but there was a lot of big belts in that room and I was really nervous. So anyway, but at that point I realized, oh yeah, he's been telling me this for years. And so I need to change some things around. And so I started looking at uh, a lot of different elements. Let's go to Jamie. All right there, sir. Are we too focused on uppercase movement rather than lo lowercase? Yeah, I think so. Is it, by the way, it's interesting that Todd mentioned timing. That was like the first thing that kind of drew to my mind as well. Um, you know, I think stances are the foundation of everything that we do. Uh, you know, we can work on blocking techniques, pairing, punching, kicking, you name it. But without a solid base and foundation uh, behind our strikes or behind our blocking techniques, it's really ineffective. So, uh, but, but that said, you know, getting the lower and upper body working in sync does take time um it's something that we all strive for and you know i think exposure increases the opportunity for students to achieve that you know the, the more the more you train the more you practice the greater your sense of calmness and and drilling your basic fundamentals you know let's you know in chapter seven the first two erect posture and good balance anatomical alignment comes to mind why is it that we've been all of a sudden becoming more erect in standing straight up, not bending our legs? I mean, if you go and look at the, the uh, classic video of, of uh, Chuck Sullivan and Ed Parker back in the 60s, they had some serious stances there, folks. Strong bases. Why have we become more erect and it seems like we're easier to topple? I feel, I feel like, uh, you know... Unfortunately, with the commercialization of martial arts, there is less focus sometimes on the lower, on our lower body, uh, you know, learn, learn the form, learn the kata, get the belt sort of thing. And, you know, uh, but, you know, you see such a great, great diversity. You see some schools of martial arts, not just Kempo, other styles too, with really rock hard, fu solid fundamentals. And you see others that, you can't, you have no idea why they're holding the belt that they are, basically. Mr. White's studio is a perfect example of that. I'm sorry, say that again there, uh, Todd. I said Mr. White's studio is a perfect example of that. I've visited on many, many occasions, or I've had the fortune to, and his people are all rock solid. I Let's mean, go to Mr. White then. Hello, Mr. White. How are you, sir? 
Welcome. Good. Thank you. And thank you, Todd. Well, it's great to be here. You know, I'm listening to everybody talk. I have absolutely no disagreement with anything that's been said. Uh, I would like to add something that we emphasize with the accuracy, speed, and power, and that's the knowledge on where to hit. You know, we put a lot of emphasis on knowing the body and knowing how to get to that liver underneath that right elbow. Uh, how will you spin your opponent? You've got your kidneys behind your opponent. So the knowledge on what targets are going to give you the best results, I think, is a critical part of the education. The path that you use to execute your techniques often give you that complementary angle to get underneath that right elbow, and therein lies the liver. In boxing, it's called the Mexican liver punch. Liver is, is pretty uh, beneficial. I think it's 60% of the blood is in the liver. And that gets knocked out. Your body goes into shock. So uh, definitely no inaccuracy. Chuck was talking about uh, learning to attack the eyes. That makes perfect sense. The throat, solar plexus, you know, just having a knowledge of the body. And a lot of times the knowledge is uh, obtained by you being hit there yourself. So you know it's uh, better to give than receive and you want to make sure you're distributing. <laughs> you know, we're in the pain <laughs> business. We much prefer the distribution. I'm going to go right back to you in two seconds, uh, Mr. White. Uh, in uh, the original Red Book, which I have with me as well, it was in the orange belt section. And here they, they actually give um, uh, the orange belt at, uh, anatomy, and he talks about the uh, – the bone structure, and he shows that both front and back on there. And then in the blue, I think it goes down to purple belt, we do the same thing. He lists that out. At some point, it would be nice just to learn when we're in there teaching a young student and as a senior student going back because it's renewed education. So it's, sometimes we call it continuing education, you know, whatever. You know, all professions usually have it if they're – worth their salt because that's part of it in the book here infinite insights if you go to pages 58 59 it lists out the skeletal bones which are really important then yeah. mr park parker talks on 61 which is what mr white was talking about the internal organs okay so these are our targets and then finally he goes under the vital targets and he not only shows them but he lists what happens but you hit them with uh, your natural weapons, and some of that is pretty ugly. Mr. White, when you're, when you're teaching these young students, how do you instill on them the proper targets to strike? Because it seems as we get to be uh, advanced, we're all over the place with our strikes. We're not even getting close to those targets. Why? Yeah, what we do with, what we do with our fighters is we think of the various targets. We break, basically break it down into four levels. The head, the chest, the stomach, the groin. Now in a self-defense situation, that could be longer all the way from the floor to the head. And then you think about what weapons would you use to go to that particular target? Like a lot of people don't have the flexibility to be able to kick to the head. So the head would be more reverse punch, back knuckle, reach hand, uh, hammer fist, that type of strike. Same thing, adjusting to the chest. No matter what the target is, list the weapons you would use to get to it and then the path you would use to get to it. And that gives people an educated idea of developing a fight plan. Okay. Let's go over to Jason Farnsworth. Jason, how are you today? Thank you for coming on. I'm glad you could be part of this. Uh, Thank you for inviting you've me. Got done. You just got done training with Mr. Planis this weekend. Yes. Tell yes. us, what did you cover on any of those basics? Because I know you went over one, <laughs> short one, uh, and, and long one. Did you go over short two and long two as well? Uh, yes. Yeah, we okay. went through. Uh, we went through the first four forms. Um, uh, you know, obviously due to the the, the COVID thing. Um, it was more in the lines of that's what we actually had to do to kind of somewhat social distance. Um, but, uh, you know, the emphasis was the same. Uh, timing, synchronization of the upper and lower body, slowing down, hitting stances, um, hitting stances. Uh, I guess I should mention hitting stances again and uh, uh, just not letting the upper body dictate uh, the lower body rather than vice versa. Uh, you know, one of the concepts that Mr. Parker talks about here on page 148, is the word relax 
and then he talks about speed. I'm going to break them down. Relax. I think one of the earliest lessons I had in a group with Mr. Parker, it always amazed me. He would get, say, left over right, horse dance, through the nose and out the mouth. Through the nose and out the mouth. And he was, you know, he'd give that breathing, breathing. What's the importance of breathing, Jason? We got uh, to help. We got to do it, folks. <laughs> well, of course. Uh, yeah, certainly. I'm being comical, but I'm being real. Okay, again, Jason, breathe. Yeah, uh, Why is absolutely. that essential to Kempo? Um, certainly to, to help solidify your base, uh, to settle in your stance, uh, striking, uh, striking with more power, uh, you know, things, things along those lines. Absolutely got to breathe and exhale like fawn strikes and stances. I'm going to go right back to uh, – to Jamie, tell us about breathing, how that you apply that in your training. Yeah, breathing's everything. Uh, and, and the other thing I would say, in addition to the good points mentioned by, by Jason, is breathing helps us maintain calmness. And I think that's so important. I mean, how many times have we all seen two people, let's call them person A and person B, and person A is clearly the faster fighter, and person B makes the person A look slower. It, it's that level of confidence and calmness that one is able to, we see it all the time. There's no reason person A should have lost that fight, but they did, they did. And I think it's because it's often one person is able to maintain a psychological edge by calmness. And that comes through breathing, just constantly breathing. And you know, maybe not exaggerated like we see in tournaments where people will scream their legs, their lungs out, keying and their face turns red for eight seconds. But just you know, a quick, a quick breath and exhale when we hit, and then that constant calmness breathing throughout. It's funny you say that because Mr. Parker links both of those to the uh, to the element of relaxing. It allows you, if you're relaxed, the muscles are more supple. They're be able mm -hmm. to be able to respond much smoother you're not as tense by the way the only time i ever see anybody screaming out like that is usually in a um, in a forms competition generally the other thing they got a mouthpiece in or they're getting the wind knocked out of them so they don't have that but you, know, you look at the two there the breathing aspect element it gives you so much there for us so let's go over here you know uh, mr sullivan how do you teach that student to relax because it's a generally let's face it it's an emotional circumstance you're in you're uh oh we got a problem here you know and we're aware that something is happening we're looking at our environment and how do you relax and calm yourself under those circumstances besides training but you might have the answer well i don't think it is besides training i think that's that is the answer uh, when you first begin freestyling i mean you're you're <laughs> oh my god Think about the first time you were a freestyle. You didn't know what you were doing. You hadn't even really probably seen that many people do it. I thought the first time I saw it, I thought those guys are nuts. And, and, I, and then I realized that I was gonna have to do that too. And very nervous, very nervous. And the more you do it, the easier it becomes. And the more you do it, the easier it becomes. And it, it, that's, that's how it just keeps, it, if you never freestyle, you can know all the things we know. But when you get into it, the nervousness is going to be there because you're not you're not accustomed to it. It's just it's just being accustomed. Just being it's just another fight. That's what that's all it is. It's just another fight. Now it's on the street. Now you got to bury the guy. But at the same time, it's just another fight. But if you don't fight at all, now it's not just another fight. It's it's like something brand new. We're looking at so, a fear factor, sir. Isn't that what we're looking at? We're what? not. It's it's fear factor. Unknown. It is a fear factor. Yeah, yeah. It's, of course. I mean, <laughs> nervousness. You know, fear is nerves, and, and uh, they, they heighten. And um, as far as breathing is concerned, uh, you certainly want to be breathing when you're when you're executing a uh, a, a shot. And uh, because at that time, if you if you happen to get one at the same time, you're more fortified. You're you're going to lose your wind like that if you're exhaling. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry if you're inhaling. Boy, your stomach is just going to be jelly. But when you're exhaling. You get more power and you're more fortified. And that's there, therefore the key guy. Uh, you know, it's you funny. Be, uh, uh, breathing uh, in and the key guy at the same time. Mr. White had brought it up to me once before. We don't want to lose that that beginning student because all of a sudden he got his butt beat up. 
you know, the first time he's out there. We sort of have to, it's sort of like swimming. You have, no, you don't just jump into it. Absolutely yeah. not. You ease people into it. You yeah. have to, sure. Exactly. Now, back in the day, they kind of threw you into it, like them teaching a kid how to swim. You throw him in the water. Not a good idea. I've seen that, and it's, it's just, I've heard stories about that. One of our guys getting ready to go to Grandmaster. He, he went to a, a school first, and the guy says, show me what you got. And he said, I got nothing. He said, well, show me. He said, I got nothing. And he, he put him in there anyhow. He said, I got, I got beat up. What kind of, what kind of teaching is that? <laughs> By fire is what it is. Let's go to Joe <laughs> yeah. Hello. Hello, Joseph. Welcome. How you doing, sir? Look at you. Can we hear you? Yes, we can. Yeah. Hi, gentlemen. Good to see you. Yeah, we're Is talking, we're, as you can see, we're talking a little bit. We were into um, the principle, basic concepts and principles of techniques. We were looking at, you know, erect posture, good balance. We're thinking about how to be relaxed. We're into a sort of a pseudo speed. And I'll talk about speed in a sec. But how do you, how do you instill in to the students to retain the proper posture, the anatomic correctness, so that they're, they can flow efficiently? rather than winging it, so to speak. Well, in regards to erect carriage and proper posture, I'm always reminded of that classic martial arts legend, My Fair Lady, and uh, Eliza Doolittle, and how uh, her, uh, her mentor places a book on top of her head and makes her walk with proper erect carriage. Um, yet, when we learn disciplines like boxing, we're taught, oh, you tuck your chin in, so you don't get clocked in the throat or under the chin. Um, but the key ingredient is proper, is, is proper posture. You know, we, as we all get older, myself included, uh, recently I tore, I tore my meniscus. So I was on a cane and I found myself hunching over a little bit. What the heck am I hunching over? My back's not, it's my knee that's messed up. And, you know, keeping a wrecked carriage of proper, proper posture and form. Uh, again, so many times, you know, we have sets in our system that's specifically designed to teach us that. You know, when we work on stance set, like stance set one, what do you do? You put your hands on your hips. Why? So you can focus on your lower body while maintaining that proper erect carriage and posture. You know, maintaining your balance in regards, not just your upper body, but lower body as well and coordinating and synchronizing the two. So, you know, we're always, we're always taught when we walk, shoulders back, back straight, eyes straight ahead. Uh, Yet people will look at other disciplines and say, yeah, well, I, I should be down here and I should tuck my shoulder in and roll my shoulder. I said, and it really is based on the particular orientation of what they've learned in regards to their art. And sometimes simply stated, it's not emphasized anymore. You know, we're not, we're not getting the good stuff anymore because little Johnny or little Susie or their, or their parents were also trained. They just want to get their next belt. They just want to get their next stripe. And they just, yeah, well, we'll get to, we'll, we'll bypass that and we'll, we'll get to the, 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 to the better stuff. No, there is no better stuff. The better stuff is a good understanding of the good stuff, of your foundational basics. Yeah, and, and that's the key. You're talking earlier about breathing. I'm reminded of that classic Warner Brothers cartoon with the big goofy dog going, die, Louie, die, if I got to breathe. And how many times do we see that when a person is built with angst and, and especially in sparring? Man, I'll never forget the first time I ever sparred. You know, we were taught to be defensive. You put two people against each other and then tell them, hey, break the every rule we taught you. What? No, we want you to be offensive now. Yeah, but you didn't teach me how to be offensive. Therefore, I don't have any point of reference. One of the coolest things I ever learned from Ed Parker was the freestyle techniques. Now, a lot of people poo-poo them off and they brush them off. You know, and they, you know, it's funny. They'll, they'll, they'll mention about, oh, well, I go and study JKD. I said, you ever learn B1A? Oh yeah, but I'll do, yeah, but that was Ed Parker and Bruce Lee brainstorming. So you had Bruce Lee in our system. You just didn't know it. You That's had B1A Bruce. and B1B. And let me interrupt you there, Joe. Sure. We, we were in Bruce Lee. Huh? Kempo went into Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee. Oh, you bet. Kempo. So it wasn't the I mean, other. I mean, look at, you know, some, I was watching Return of the Dragon and we were talking about freestyle techniques in Kempo. I said, you want to see freestyle techniques in application? Watch Bruce Lee against Chuck Norris and Return of the Dragon. Look for TSKRK. Look for B1AH. Look, it's all in there. Where do you think he got it from? You know, Mr. Parker was fascinated with working with Bruce and learning a freestyle techniques. And the key ingredient, I was just in, I was no longer stuck in a scenario where 
Well, you're supposed to attack me. No, 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 you're supposed to attack me. If we don't have offensive application of our defensive technique, incorporating proper posture, our foundational basics, stances, blocks, punches, strikes, finger techniques, kicks and foot maneuvers, and maneuvers, by the way. You mentioned foot maneuvers. At one point, Mr. Parker changed it from foot maneuvers to general maneuvers. Why? To incorporate body maneuvers. Again, what was the first thing little, Ed, little Edmund learned when he was a small child? Boxing. His dad was a middleweight contender. He was a boxing commissioner for Hawaii for 35 years. So what did young Edmund learn? He learned how to bob, how to slip, how to weave. Those are our maneuvers. So we have to have that incorporation of foot maneuvers along with body maneuvers. But we can't have those unless our embryonic basics are solid. With that in mind, let's go to let's go to let's go to Todd Durgan. Todd, give us a textbook uh, a definition on speed. Well, okay, so so speed, we, and somebody has already mentioned this to an extent. Uh, speed it can only come from relaxation. Oxygen, an, an oxygenated an oxygenated brain is a relaxed and ready brain, and uh, a calm brain, as Mr. Seabrook was saying. So, you know, speed, speed can be constipated and stifled so much by um, tension and a position of readiness that isn't relaxed. Um, speed is also very deceptive or can be deceptive. I remember I was freestyling with Mr. Rainey one time. I was an eager brown belt and he was far superior to my skill. Little did I know at the time. Anyway, uh, actually I knew, but I was educated. Uh, I was going to blitz him. And in the time that it took me to get to him, he had done a step back spinning roundhouse kick and caught me in the heart. Put me back about three feet, knocked the wind out of me, popped three of my ribs out. And uh, I, for the several years later, wondered how in the world he could have done that so fast. So that brings me to the next element of speed. There's... There are the three, or uh, well, I guess Mr. Parker has them classified differently, but basically focus on physical, mental, and synaptic, right? Or synaptic and mental are kind of the same. Uh, speed can be, uh, you know, the, the speed of one person can be overcome by another through the observation or proper observation of telegraphing. My blitz was heavily telegraphed, unbeknownst to me. And so Mr. Rainey picked up on that and did his very smoothly executed step back spinning around house kick to my heart and screwed up my world for about three minutes. Um, <clears throat> so yes, yeah, so speed is a, is a culmination of uh, proper timing and breathing. You have to breathe because you have to be relaxed. You're, if your muscles aren't oxygenated and if they're tense, then you can't explode. Speed comes from explosive motion. Okay, well, I'm gonna give you something I told you before. I wrote this down. I thought of speed as a measurement, acceleration or deacceleration of time. It is a measurement of acceleration or deacceleration of time. Now the big problem people think is, what's the difference between time and tempo? Time and tempo, and in music, tempo is a constant rate of time does that make sense to you if i'm doing 96 beats per per minute it's that if i'm doing 122 it's much faster so the question is it's consistent however what we see in campo is not that i will bet that if you look at some vintage footage of bob white competing you will see him execute precisely in a precise tempo of responses to an opponent. He won't just throw a flurry and figure out which one's gonna work. He picks his, move, his, his choice of his target, his weapon, and he times it correctly so that he can be most effective. Just like what Mr. Rainey did with you when you were working with him. However, he had the advanced experience. So that's what I think of when I think of a speed. I, I think people are preoccupied with the paint job. Okay, I hate to use that as a metaphor, but we're going down the street and we see two people driving there 
and one of them's driving a red car and the other one's driving a white car. Well, our eyes are obviously going to gravitate immediately to the red car because red is a very explosive color to our senses, okay? So we're going to look at that, and that's what we think. Well, when you go to a tournament and you watch somebody do a self-defense uh, competition or maybe a form or whatever, you're going to watch them, and they're going to go very rapidly trying to impress everybody with their red color of speed because they think that is more impressive rather than to be consistent with their tempo and pick the appropriate speed so it looks effective, efficient, it hits the targets consistently, and that the result will be promising for us. So let's ask Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Sullivan, how do you define the proper uh, speed of your response? And I know you're going to give it 100%. So, Well, first of all, I think uh, a lot of people confuse speed with quickness. Quickness is being able to get off the dime and get to your opponent or get away from your opponent. And that's reflex. And we all have uh, varying degrees of reflex. You can work on reflex, but speed is once, is once you're going, once you get the, the initial move. Uh, when you try, <clears throat> initially, I think we have to realize what somebody else said earlier, that uh, it's the elimination of all the extraneous moves. I mean, I do a little demonstration, and it's, it's just, it, it's, it's kind of stupid, really, because how uh, people hold a hand up, <clears throat> and I'll, with my arm completely relaxed at my side, I'll hit their hand before they can pull it away even an inch. And I'll do it like nine times out of ten. They cannot get away from that punch because I'm, I'm only using one move. Now, if I, if I go cock and hit, they'll see that in a heartbeat and the hand will move. So it's, it's just being able to get a pure move. And as far as attack, and even, even uh, in, in defense. And then, of course, distance, distancing is so important because if you're too far, it doesn't make any difference how fast you are because you've got too much, too much distance to cover. You're going to uh, telegraph that move simply because of that. So if it's, a, if it's an attack, you've got to have your distancing exactly right. I've got a picture of uh, Steve Sanders, Muhammad, and he's doing a, I'm doing a high kick, and he's, he's leaning away from it. And I said, but now check out where his feet are at. And his foot is so close to mine. I said, now, after I've kicked, when he stands up, look where he's at in, in relationship to me. He doesn't have to move in on me. He's already in on me. And then, of course, he blasts you because he was away. He, he avoided the kick. But when he came back, when you were putting your foot down and he came back in, he already had the distance. He had, he had the, the juxtapositioning. And therefore, he got, the, he got the shot. You didn't, and he did. Let's go to Mr. White. Mr. White, I'm going to go into the ring with you, sir. And what I think Mr. Sullen was talking about was the concept of action versus reaction. Action versus reaction. Mr. Parker used to talk about that principle. What was the answer to how do you respond as reaction? You know when you're in the ring, you are sizing up your opponent. You know what your skills are. Frank used to teach the footwork of angling off on your opponent without losing distance so you could counterpunch him. Otherwise, you'd have to step out of the way. Or in Frank's case, he said you have to move the target first to avoid it getting hit. What are your thoughts? Well, a lot of your speed is developed by early recognition. And the most difficult technique to defend against is one you have not seen before. So that's why we advocate sparring as much as you possibly can with people of different styles. Speed also is tremendously enhanced by the distance you travel to get your opponent. So we really advocate an idea of both hands always to the forward side of center. You don't want to get your hand back on the other side of center because you have to travel so much more distance to get to it. So early recognition, traveling less distance to get to the target, um, educated anticipation so that you know what your opponent's tendencies are so that your plan, you said something at the beginning, I think it was Sun Tzu was talking about, you have to know you're going to be victorious. And 
Muhammad Ali used to say that. His victories took place in the gym long before he ever went into the arena. And it's how you train, how you prepare, and things start to slow down considerably. One of the big things with Ed Parker when I first started, I was so amazed of how, how much power he could generate in such short areas. He would do a simple move like snapping twig, his hands are out here, where other people would be out in a wide circle to get that much speed. But his explosiveness from in close was just amazing. Uh, what we do is we work on, and Mr. Parker drew this for me years ago, a big circle. And then like layers of an onion, you start cutting off the circle. At the moment you feel you've lost power, it's time to take a step back and elongate your circle. So uh, that type of work we do on the bags, where can you be, how close can you be and generate your speed? Uh, and the moment you've lost your power, then you need to back off a little bit because you're never gonna throw a technique that you don't feel that it's gonna be effective. So a lot of it's empowerment just by making contact and getting your range. It's funny you bring that up. I remember I was getting ready for the internationals and I was watching Frank and as you know, he was an excellent kicker. So uh, we were studying and I was looking at some footage of Bruce Lee doing this long gated and most of you have seen Enter the Dragon where he does a big long crossover several times and he hits a sidekick into um, Bob Wall's chest and throws him back and, and such and such. So, um, I applied that same idea that you said, but I did not know about that at the time where I just said, how close can I get to the heavy bag and do a jumping kick until I was just, I couldn't get any closer because I couldn't, I couldn't uh, create the power that you're talking. So I initially stuck it back and I used that in a tournament and it was very effective. Uh, so you had talked just recently on a, on a Kimple Karate Hall of Fame Kempo Minutes. And by the way, I encourage everybody to visit those Kempo Minutes because you'll get an insight into a speaker like a Senior Master Arts, Bob White. He will tell you. You talked about the preparation for the fight is more important than actually, I think, in the fight. You said, I'm, I'm paraphrasing you. Help me with that. Yeah, the will to win is great, but the will to prepare to win is better. And it's just laying the groundwork for success. You know, it's that old thing, the harder I study, the luckier I got on my chest. You know, that's, that's how it is in fighting. If the guys that are raising to the top right now in combat sports, whether it's boxing, kickboxing, MMA, are normally the guys that train the hardest. Uh, you could be the best car in the world, but if you don't have any gas, you're not going anywhere. And same thing in the ring. If you don't prepare yourself, uh, spar with as many people as possible. I always talk about Chuck Yeager. Chuck Yeager was our number one test pilot. First guy to break the sound barrier. Well, he flew everything he could because he knew that accumulative knowledge might save his life in some adverse situation. And that's how fighting is too. You need to fight as many people as possible. Get in the best shape you can. So you've got your T's crossed and your I's dotted and you're not going to go in there surprised. Like I said, if you haven't seen anything, you've got to adjust to it. By that time, you're already home thinking about what went wrong. You train hard in the gym and then you get yourself the best chance to be successful. Whether it's self-defense or whether it's in the ring. They're, they're, I always look at it, fighting as fighting. And if you prepare yourself properly, your chances of success are going to be enhanced. Was there anybody that you can remember was your that influenced your fighting or inspired you in your fighting, be it either in the martial arts or in some other form of fighting? Yeah, a lot of people. You know, I was fortunate. Uh, Steve Mohammed would come down to our school when I was a brown belt. Benny Urquides would come down. A lot of the BKF guys were very close and are really close friends. Uh, when I fought with the Chuck Norris uh, team in Albuquerque, we all trained together. You know, Mike Stone would have all-star tournaments. And you fight with these great guys and you learn. Like Chuck Sullivan was saying, we steal. If we see something that works, we'd be foolish to not use it. That's why there really is an American eclectic style of karate. 
Uh, that's what Mike Stone named his book. And it is an accumulation of a lot of different people. You know, I watched Chuck Norris and Steve Muhammad. They were throwing spinning back knuckles. You know, I was watching a blitz by Steve Muhammad. I want to, I want to be able to do that. Uh, with the full recognition, there's some things that you're going to learn and embrace, but maybe you don't have the physical skills to do it. But you recognize it and you know it. And then when it's done against you, you automatically have a reference and your defense against that is going to be enhanced. So you, you just can't beat preparation. Preparation is the key, in, but you got to love it because if you don't love it, you're not going to do it. And if you don't do it, you're going to end up uh, with those second, third place trophies and second place in a real fight is not a good place to be. <laughs> uh, honestly, uh, you don't want to be anywhere but victorious in a fight. You can... <laughs> and you know what? No, I, not at all. One of the things that Mr. White uh, bra just went over briefly, conditioning, conditioning. I'll say it one more time. Right, Mr. White? Conditioning. If you don't have that it's conditioning. It's the key. Cardio is the king. You're going you're gonna, to, Jason, who were the people that influenced you when it came to sparring? Who did you look to? Who did you watch? Who did you say, maybe I can learn that move from? Everybody. <laughs> yeah, just about anybody that I've seen. Um, you know, I actually got into the arts um, just kind of uh, basically on a whim. Uh, the only reason I joined was to offset uh, and augment my, my, my training in between re the wrestling season. And I actually didn't put forth a, a whole lot of effort when I was younger. I did, but not the effort that I do today, obviously, because I was only looking to stay in there from, you know, a short time till wrestling season came. And then, um, you know, then I was just going to, you know, just do a summer type of a thing. And I, I've met a lot of good people uh, along my way and my path uh, here in in my area. And uh, one of the things that uh, I, I had a, a, the opportunity to, to do some actual amateur kickboxing when I was younger um, with a gentleman who um, I don't really want to drop names and stuff like that here on the internet. Don't worry, Joe Rabella doesn't mind. <laughs> well, <laughs> Well, he had a he had a uh, the gentleman that actually taught me and several other guys for probably about a year before again went back to the wrestling season because that's really what I wanted to do uh, until I really fell in love with actually doing the arts. Uh, but uh, this gentleman had a cousin who was a really uh, highly ranked um, boxer, uh, and, and so during our kickboxing, that's what we mainly did in in our gym was actually worked on boxing skills and. Also during my tenure with my very first instructor who, you know, I'll, I'm not going to talk about that, but um, I actually had a chance to uh, train with a gentleman who went to uh, the Olympic trials back in 92. And I trained with him through the end of 90 through most of 91 until the training was just way too brutal and uh, just couldn't keep up with it. Trying to go to school, trying to go to wrestling practice, trying to do that at the end of the day, uh, it just didn't work out right. And, um, you know, so um, I was actually fortunate to have these gentlemen along my path uh, teaching me and uh, doing things that uh, I thought at that time at 16, 17 years old was absolutely amazing. And, uh, you know, those things that I carry to with my, my kids train, of course, I have a lot more kids than I do adults. And uh, some of the things I did with, with those guys, I train uh, my kids to do different combinations, doing bag work, focus mitt work, kicking shield work off of those gentlemen that actually taught me when I was younger coming up into the arts. Okay. Let's go to Jamie. Jamie, help me with uh, your focus of accuracy. How do you enhance that to make sure that you have the one strike take down your opponent? Yeah, I mean, I mean, my students do a lot of uh, focus mitt training, so we do a lot of uh, um, strikes on the focus mitts, hands and or feet. We uh, we work on uh, sparring very, very regularly, and uh, and and I think our techniques help a lot too at at getting the precise targets. Um, that comes that comes with more exposure. The more you you work on accuracy, the better you become. Sure, I remember with Frank, uh, we would work. He was big on the heavy bag. So I'm going to tell you right now, folks, you talk about conditioning that Mr. White was talking about. 
go to the heavy bag. I'm talking a hundred pound bag, put on the gloves and pound away on that sucker and make it move for at least a minute. And I mean, just hit it once and then wait a few seconds. I mean, really work your jab, your cross, your hook, your uppercut combinations, start pounding for about a minute. You'll be fatigued after that. It's like, it's hard. And then try to build it up to two or three minutes. Move from that, and then Frank would send me over to, I'm sorry about this, Mr. Sullivan, the Century Bob, my perfect duck. <laughs> and I would use that, and I would take the gloves off, and what we would do is speed movements. So we work power first, and then Mr. White would probably take issue with me a little bit on this, but I would try to push my speed uh, or my to keep and keep it the tempo consistent. There's a difference. You need to have speed and tempo have to be consistent. You'll find that a lot of times in tournaments, you'll watch a person do a form and they'll start off at one speed and then their tempo will drop because they can't keep it. Okay. So yeah. they run out of it because they didn't condition. So we go to the speed bag or which we would use, or we would go to, in my case, I use the century Bob and then finally ended up with the focus mitts. But that, that was those back in those days. You know, I still do that now with the guy. I work the living hell out of them. So, you know, I'm going over to Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Sullivan. Let me say this about, about freestyle. You guys weren't around before the first internationals. And I got to tell you, before the, the first internationals, and actually before about from the first to the third internationals, nobody knew what the hell they were doing. Really, none of us. The freestyle was horrible. It was, it was, it was childish by comparison to what it got to be. And it's only because we are such great thieves in this country that we learn from each other. In the beginning, you could tell without even looking at a guy's patch, if he was Japanese, Chinese, Korean, Okinawan, or what he was, what his style was, simply by the way he fought. I actually saw this, and it, I, it, <laughs> this was at the first international championships. The guys got squared off, and they, they Hawaiian guys, these were guys from, from Honolulu, they actually got in a, in a square horse facing their opponent with their hands out like this, and they didn't move until the guy made a move against them, and then they would start to fight. But, I mean, of course, they were jumping around in the meantime when the guy was making his move. It was the most ridiculous thing you ever saw. Now I never saw it again, but by, by the time the second internationals, I mean, these guys had learned. You know, said in the streets of Hawaii, chances are if somebody went like this to you, everybody knew what they were doing. they say, oh, the hell with this guy. He's training. I'm like, I won't mess with him. But in the internationals, are you kidding me? I mean, by the next time they were, they were, they were faced off, we learned from each other. And, and things didn't start really developing and getting good until about the third or fourth internationals when we had a chance to see and steal from each other. And then after a while, you couldn't tell a Korean stylist from an Okinawan, from a Chinese, from a Japanese, because we all started finding more or less the same depending upon you and your abilities and, and, and what you had going for you individually and, uh, and what you developed and so on. But that's what it, that is, that's what it really got good. Because <laughs> before that, we were terrible. And I say we, I mean all of us. Todd, tell us about angles. Angles is one of the principles Mr. Parr talks about in Chapter 7. How do the angles play in into our analysis of fighting? Well, Mr. White covered that a little bit, actually, with regard to, you know, off angling. I believe it was Mr. White, uh, off angling in your defense and or in your offensive maneuvers. But uh, angles can create distance as well as uh, lack of target or distance as well as a gain of a target. So understanding and using, uh, uh, but they're coupled together with your foot maneuvers or footwork. Uh, because you have to have proper foot maneuvers and timing to acquire the proper angle uh, without getting hit or to get in to hit. Um, uh, let's see, I think it was, uh, I think it's Benny the Jet. I think, it, I think uh, Benny Urquidez, he had some great off angle stuff that he would do in some of his fights. Um, you know, but, but <laughs> I've seen, I, I don't know how many of you have seen uh, Mr. White's uh, fight in the ring uh, the, from, I don't know when it was, pardon me, Mr. White, if I get this wrong, I think it was in the 70s, he did this flying axe kick. So that changes the angle. <laughs> Right, and he—I mean, it was—it was beautifully executed. It's on YouTube somewhere. You can see it. Uh, the guy came in, Mr. White. Uh, he just—he changed his angle, not side to side, but he went up and came over. 
and he went in on the guy and I mean, he caught it perfectly, got up, got the point or, you know, it was, uh, it was an awesome uh, technique. So angles are very important. You can stand in the way, you know, if you stand on the train track, you're going to get hit by the train. If you step off the track, change your angle, you're not going to get hit by the train. Mr. White, let's talk to you about that. When you were developing, I, I'm going to call it a hatchet kick. I'm, I don't know what else you would call it, but you can tell me. When you de what was the influence on that? Where did you come up with that idea? Just show it off. You know, really is what it is. You know, uh, one thing I, I appreciate Todd mentioning that um, any films of me losing a fight have been destroyed, by the way. I want to mention that. Uh, you know, you just, you have to have fun. You know, every time I'd work out with Benny or Benny, I, when we'd fight against each other in a tournament or we'd fight against Steve, first thing Benny would say is, let's put on a really good show. So, I mean, that's, in a sport like that, you can experiment and try different things. And, you know, that's why I used to love kicking to the head. You know, it was just something that uh, was, you know, not too many people could do it very effectively. So it was something that not too many people were good defending against it. So that's really the motivation is the only limitations are those you accept. That's an Ed Parker saying. The skills that the people have now are just amazing. You know, I, I don't know if you guys have watched Raymond Daniels, but Raymond throws these jumping, spinning back kicks. He'll put one foot on a guy's chest, spin in midair, and knock the guy out with a kick to the side of the head. Or go directly underneath the liver with a spinning, underneath the elbow with a spinning back kick and get that liver and just drop people. So the sport continues to grow. I do agree with, with Chuck Sullivan and uh, Mike Stone said exactly the same thing. He felt from 1969 to 1974 was the biggest evolution of karate techniques because everybody was started working with each other and learning from each other. And it, and it really was, uh, a tremendous growth period. Now you go to a big tournament. Uh, as an example, everyone used to fight left foot forward. And now probably 19 out of 20 of the top fighters fight right foot forward. And Ed Parker, you know, that's what we do in our yellow belt techniques, first five yellow belt techniques, right foot forward. And that's that Bruce Lee influence and then Ed Parker's influence. So uh, I think just experimentation you know, we move away from pain and toward pleasure and throwing a technique that nobody else has seen, that's pleasurable. So that's something that you kind of motivates you. I'm going to quote two things here. Parker in Zen says, quote, since in inventions are created because of existing needs, innovations are also needed in Kempo. Innovations are also needed in Kempo. That's the first thing there. Second thing he says here, mm -hmm. He looks at this, he goes, principles are the keys which allow men to use their tools properly and effectively. Being that's the case, Jamie, going to you, how are we evolving in Kempo? How do we improve? How do we grow, evolve? Mr. White talked from 69 to 74, the greatest growth in the tournament scene. What about now? This is 2020. Yeah, I mean, I mean, here's what I'd say about that. I mean, American Kempo is my art. I love it. It's it's my base. It's all I've known, really. But uh, I, I do think it's important to also cross train. So, uh, you know, I, I think I mentioned this last time. I've been st studying uh, Gracie Jiu Jitsu since early 2012, and it's been an eye opener. Like, you know, and I think the early UFCs, if I'm being honest, exposed striking styles. You know, there were so many people that had went back when people weren't cross training as much and they were in their, their respective styles. Uh, you know, Hoist Gracie would use distance management. He'd avoid the kicks, avoid the punches, get in, tie you up, take you to the ground. Fight was over. It was the same result over and over. And I, I, I do think even when we spar, right, which I, I'm a big believer in sparring. But if we're sparring and, and the person gets really close, what do we do? We usually break or we'll do a couple rabbit punches to the back of the head or we break and start the, start the game all over again. And I, and I, I don't think that's as real as it's going to be. I mean, if someone's close enough to get their hands on us, 
uh, you know, our five swords won't cut it anymore. These rabbit punches, we don't have the power behind them because they were all tied up. Well, I'm gonna, oh, and I'm gonna, they're, I'm gonna, they're all gonna sick you now. They're all gonna jump on you and motivate you. Let's see okay. how you do with this one. I'm gonna let them all go after you. First of all, two things to qualify. One, one is a sport and one's life. So let's get real, okay? In a sport, you have rules, obviously. And, you know, when you're in jujitsu, you're in, a, in, the, in the ring, you have, a, you have an official that's sitting there to stop things gonna happen. There's certain things that are not allowed. I will guarantee you right now, you put Mr. Sullivan in against one of those guys, they're never going to walk again because he's going to make sure that every target he hits is vital. And if I, if I shatter your knee while you try to grab me or I hit you with an inward elbow, Jamie, and I break your jaw, you're going to say, that's not fair. You can't do that. That's, that's not part of the rules. And the problem is Todd Durgan's going to answer that right now. Right, Todd? What's the deal with that, huh? Well, so this goes back to what somebody else had said about surprise and not if you don't know what it is, if, you, if you've never seen it, uh, you don't know what to do. And early on, that was exactly the case in the UFCs. Nobody knew, uh, certainly the strikers and the, or what they called the strikers and the karateka had no idea what to do against a, a, a Gracie Jiu-Jitsu stylist or any Jiu-Jitsu stylist for that matter because that's just not the realm that they were uh, familiar with. Now, look, if you look at what's happening, there's actually a, a lot more stand-up fighting happening, even in the UFC. That being said, in combat, and I do work a little bit of groundwork, reluctantly, but I do it because it's a necessity, to not to be better at it, but to better, better understand it. So just a quick story, and then I'll turn it back over. I had a, one of my students as a jiu-jitsu stylist, and, I, and uh, I was trying to show how we, for some reason in Kempo or in the martial arts striking systems, kind of lose our mind when we end up on the ground, or a lot of these guys are cross-training jiu-jitsu, and then they go to the ground, and they, they lose all of their Kempo, and they just practice the, you know, the locks and the containments and the tap out of the jiu-jitsu. So I told him, I said, go ahead and put a triangle choke on me, get it good, cinch it down, and I, I let him get it on, get a good, strong triangle choke. And I don't know if you've ever been uh, tapped or hit in the lateral femoral cutaneous, and this goes back to targeting. Uh, but I rabbit punched him, talking about rabbit punches, a couple of times real quick with a good solid hook punch to his lateral femoral cutaneous. He screamed like a little girl and couldn't get away from me fast enough as his legs flew open and he crawled backwards. So the point being that Yes, we need to understand it. I don't know that we need to spend as much time doing it as some do, but we also need to not forget what our base system is. You talked about that, Jamie, and, and, and I, you know, we just can't forget that. If you get down on the ground, don't forget what it, I mean, you know, how many years have you spent training this other thing and now, you know, all of a sudden all, it all, you know, goes down the toilet and now i need to focus on this thing that i know nothing about or or little about yeah. jamie has a point he has a lot of experience he's trained a lot for 12 uh, at least eight years now ground uh work so he understands when he's down there he's comfortable it's like you said the more you spar the more comfortable you will be in the circumstances so you won't panic you won't have the fear factor you know todd jumped on it and said he used he knew exactly where the target was to that needed to be struck. Therefore, his accuracy came into play. Your thoughts? They're, they're absolutely right. Uh, the more you do it, the more comfortable you'll be, the less you'll panic, uh, the less likely you are, you are to uh, have somebody manipulate you uh, at their will. Um, unfortunately, it's a very demanding um, effort. And the older you get, the harder it is. The last time that I went to the ground, we were doing a lot of ground fighting, and uh, I finally wound up on crutches because my knee got completely popped out. A guy spread me, and I heard it. And everybody else heard it. And I, I went to stand up, and I couldn't. But the problem with the ground is if you mess around with it long enough, you're going to get hurt. I've known at least one person that actually he didn't die from it, but he died later because of it. I know he did, although he put it off to something else, broke his neck. Um, 
it's uh, it's a very very dangerous thing to do especially like like i said the last time i did it was in my late 60s well that was 20 years ago yeah so I, you, know, sir, uh, you you just gotta you gotta be careful uh with, with that but now i do i do agree with it and uh, also when they played their game when they first came over they played their game and and they took us down and we were out of our water they were, were in their wet water and they did sit, sit they had their way with us and as things went on and we, we they started training in their styles you know it got better and better now just not too long ago one of my guys uh he's he's done the ground thing and he went to a place and uh some guy said well you don't want to go in and he said sure so the guy went to shoot at him and he stuck his knee out he caught him in the forehead and, and the guy was oh, wait, wait a minute he says you you can't do that rudy <laughs> says no i just did yeah funny is that uh I remember two incidences that I always try to put into consideration. You know, when you think of the groundwork, you know, and I, I applaud Jamie. I'm just, I just feel I'm too old to be playing around on the ground because you're going to get hurt. I'm going to get hurt in my age. Yeah. You know, I get hurt enough with my five-year-old, let alone right. I, want to <laughs> with some guy. I fell out of a moving car. I'm not kidding you. I fell out of a moving car at about 15 miles an hour. It was, it was, I was 20 something at the time and I was studying and pass. It was because of my training and pass. I relaxed when I fell out and I rolled my clothes looked like I was totally torn up as if I was a zombie and I took no injuries, but it was because I relaxed. My assessment of was that if I go to the ground, it's either going to happen Two, th three things are possible. One, it's an unknown factor for me. That's all. That's all I can say. Second of all, I'm either going to use it to my advantage or it will be used against me. And the problem is you have all those other environmental awareness issues that you have to. Is it wet? Is it dry? Is it uneven? Is it rocky? Is it soft? Is it sand? I want to go to the ground? I'm going to send you to the ground. And Parker told me this. Is just blast out the guy's leg, and then when he goes down, you know, try to, you know enough, Kemple, to save it. So we'll go now to Joe Rebello. Okay, back to you, Joe. And we were talking here, the awareness factor of us as a striking system, but I think you and I are now going to go, we're going to go on a European tour. We're going to have a trip. We're going to vacation. It'll be fun. We're over there, and you speak several languages. Am I right? You bet. So you're going to have an advantage over me, just like Jamie will have an advantage over me as well because he spends more time on the ground working that. However, that's a controlled environment, probably on a soft mat. What is our advantages if we address somebody and don't go to the ground using our striking system? Well, again, I, I'm a firm believer. I mean, Mr. Parker himself incorporated many elements of uh, his jujitsu training. I mean, the second art Ed Parker ever learned was judo. You know, he got his black belt in judo. Many people aren't aware of that. And he saw a particular incident he never forgot where these two guys were fighting and were fighting on the ground and someone walked right up and kicked one of the guys dead in the head. When you got some big Samoan popping you in the head with it right in your temple and knocking you out cold, he was like, well, maybe not the ground isn't the best place to be. Um, however, I also had the honor, the privilege, and the pleasure of studying over half a dozen jujitsu systems and the most notable being David German in Thai. And he really was the person that really incorporated and infused the, uh, the coordination, cooperation, Mr. Parker's system with jujitsu, including choking and strangulation and ground techniques. And, uh, you know, the, you, I always feel that you should have at least a fundamental training. Why? So you can get out of it. So you recognize when those tools are being applied. You, know, you talk about the UFC and you talk about Hoist Gracie. Well, go back and watch that one. Why don't you watch his fight against Kimo Lapoto? Why don't you watch how the, his line of fighters had to carry him out because Kimo had beaten the living crap out of him. And because of the, you know, he likes, you get to get this big Samoan Hawaiian pounding on you. And, um, you know, you're waiting and you're trying to get your spot. And indeed, he got his spot. But at what price? You know, we talk about rolling on the ground, you know, and I, like I said, I, I love the work I did with David German, learning about shimewaza, niwaza, and also learning on, okay, now that you're in this position, the mount or the guard, how can you apply your kempo from that angle? If we can apply a movement standing up, now is the wall 
nothing more, as Mr. Parker would say, than a vertical wall, a vertical floor. I mean, we look at techniques like taming the mace, you know, and we're blasting the guy, and that's an old Kaju Kempo technique. I parry it off, I back this guy, what do I do? I slam him into the wall, and then I elbow him in the face and knee him in the groin. Gee, could I do that on the floor and roll over to achieve mount position and blast as I'm doing it? Of course we can. I think having at least a foundation knowledge of these things are important. So I'm going now to Jamie. Jamie, we've been beating up on you. Sorry, sir. You know, no problem. It's cool. Come back. We were talking about evolution, so I'm just, I'm just giving my opinion. <laughs> well, here's the cool thing. Mr. Parker has a quote. He says, the equation formula is the universal pattern expressed with principles expressed with principles isn't that what we're all about re-examining what we're what we're dealing with and the a proper response to it so uh, that your training you have advanced your responses and your ability to deal with different equations both standing and also on the ground okay so thus you you might be able to apply a principle that will help you to to neutralize nullify or cancel out this individual's attack. However, I believe, and this is my personal opinion, Ed Parker created our system for multiple attackers as best as he could because one punch strikes. Look at you know most of the two-man attacks or any of our attacks. They're very simplistic, direct, effective. If you don't believe me, get on the, on the mat with Chuck Sullivan. Old school style, gets in there, Direct, not a lot of fluff, and it, it means when he hits you, he means business, okay? So how do we address that? Because we have this problem, and I'm not trying to thwart or play down Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I think it's amazing. I really do. It takes a, a lot of, of patience, a practice time, commitment, as Mr. White would say, but we're a striking system, so... Let's stop worrying about learning Japanese when we mostly speak English in this country. I'm not saying you not to learn it. I'm just saying, how do we add to our knowledge, our toolbox, so to speak? Yeah, well, I'd say a couple of things. One, I would say that, um, you know, since I started Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, uh, my love for Kempo has gone through the roof even more. I have a new appreciation for locking horns and what it's like to be in a tough guillotine choke as a, you know, as opposed to maybe just kind of like a front choke. And, and I think it, it, it helps you expand your knowledge of Kempo more. And, and it's not like, you know, like I, I understand the argument, you know, the last part spot you want to be in a street fight's on the ground. I mean, if there's multiple attackers, you're dead. But I don't think there's anybody, for example, in Gracie Jiu Jitsu that say, I'd want to take someone to the ground in a multiple fight. They'd say, get out of there if you can. The best spot to be is to, to basically run. And, and, you know, the thing is, the thing is, you know, I agree with the idea of the multiple attackers in American Kempo. But if we think of any of our two-man techniques, so Falcons of Forest, Bear and the Ram, Courting the Tiger, Ram and the Eagle, Grasping Eagles, they've already grabbed us. So, if, you know, if we, if we are saying that if there's multiple attackers, we've all, I've probably all done two on one, three on one sparring and, you know, use one as a shield, take proper angles. Sure. But all of our techniques, not all of them, but the vast majority of our two man techniques, uh, two person techniques, they've already got their hands on us. Like bear and the ram, we're in a bear hug from behind and someone's, so up to that point, our distance management didn't work that great. Now I know we can pull off Bear and the Ram and look, make it look really good. And people go, wow, that's, that's sweet. But like we've been talking about today, in times of stress, nerves kick in. Uh, we're not as relaxed. Our, our muscles are strained. You know, how many times have we, have we done something? This happened to me so many times where I thought I'm in the best shape I can be. And then, you know, shoot, I'm eight minutes in and I'm thinking, why am I exhausted? I'm exhausted because of the nerves, because of the stress. So I love all the, the two-man techniques. I think they're amazing. I just think that, you know, Kempo can be grab me anywhere and I can get out of it. And it's not that easy. That's just my thought. You know, Mr. Parker talks about that in the web of knowledge. And as you've said, we're dealing, first of all, what is the first, uh, you know, that, uh, that he addresses grabs and then chokes 
and then and then pushes, tackles, etc. In other words, the opponent is already on us, okay? And then it slowly moves away from us in the web of knowledge because he's structuring it. If what do we deal with this uh, uh, this attack? And and I think that's a comfort zone because we're first learning. Well, what do you do if somebody grabs you? Yeah. You know, what if somebody tries to tackle you or choke you? And then we start to get into, you know, the pushes, etc. And then uh, we get into the kicks and 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 punches and whatnot. You know, we go to you know if you think about that, uh, Mister. Uh, Sullivan, you address that all the time. Somebody comes on, your master form. I mean, use every weapon that's available to you. I see you literally headbutts, kicks to the groin, back kicks, stomps. How many people do we actually remember to stomp the instep of the opponent's foot? Break his break the bones in the foot. I'm gonna be nice. Censor, I won't cut this all up later. <laughs> you Go ahead. Elaborate on that, sir. Well, if it can be used as a weapon, you know, we've used it. And uh, because headbutts weren't necessarily in Kempo, doesn't mean they're a, a, a non-effective weapon. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. If you're in close, if somebody's got you in a bear hug from the front, and well, of course, you still have the groin, of course. But, uh, and it depends on height. And, uh, the headbutt is not universal. Because if a guy's real tall, I'm not going to headbutt him in the chest. And if, if, the, if I'm taller than the guy, I'm not going to headbutt him on the top of his head. So it, it is it is relative. You got to be more or less the same size, but you always have the other uh, the other weapons. Thank you so much, Mr. Sullivan. Happy birthday to you. God bless you, sir. Thank you, guys, and and this has been great. I really okay, love we're going to uh, go right over to uh, uh, Jason Farnsworth. Jason, yes. a couple weeks ago we talked about short three, and Mr. White was there. We we're talking about destructive twins, where opponents <laughs> grabbing. And my, my response to that was very simple. I said, well, if I'm in there, you know, chances are I may use a headbutt. And I was told, well, how do you headbutt somebody when you punch him in the face? Easy. That's within a millisecond. Remember, folks, this is happening like this. Jamie, it's happening like this. Boom, 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 boom. This is coming at you really fast. Now, if you're relaxed and you've trained and you spend a quality time with Bob White and his instructors – you understand, you're assessing. We're doing all this. We're looking for it. But we're hitting with him. We're going to look at the targets. And my response was that if I hit him and he doesn't release, I grab him and I pull him in and hit my, my forehead on, his, on a bridge of his nose. I guarantee you probably let go. And then I can knee him in the groin or kick him in the groin or stomp him on the foot. So we have different ways to respond. The point I'm saying is that you're in, we're, we're cross-training now. Jamie's right. Jamie's right about cross-training. Mr. White said it earlier. You, we steal from one another. We look and we see what's going to work. Hopefully you learn from the right instructor, Mr. White. Go into your school, I guarantee that's going to happen. But if you don't have Jamie in front of you to teach you, Jason, how do you deal with that? you got to have some kind of cross-training. Absolutely. <clears throat> I'm, I'm actually fortunate enough that I've had a friend for 20, I think about 20 years now. He owns a school about five miles from where I live. And uh, he's a, a third or fourth degree black belt at this point under Helson Gracie himself. And over the course of time, uh, due to my wrestling background, uh, I used to drop in on him. I actually used to take classes with him on Saturday mornings uh, before I actually started teaching on my own. And one of the things I've, I've said many, many a times to a lot of people is, is if you really want to understand a ground fighters game, you actually have to get into a ground fighters game. If that's what we're, we're, we're looking at and it was it was a it was certainly an interesting experience uh to go from um say you know wrestling background kempo background to just strictly uh on the ground uh fighting choking locking and and whatnot uh then there are, obviously as as somebody had said uh, i think it was you mr casey that you know there are set rules for everything uh, when your butt's on the line and it's out in the street, well, then it's anything goes. But when you're on the mat, um, 
there's always a set of rules that you have to follow. And I certainly applaud Mr. Seabrook for, for doing so. My body can no longer hold out and, and do that stuff in the ground game, unfortunately, with too many uh, injuries and lagging bodily parts that uh, can't be uh, contorted out of position any longer, uh, or else I'd be doing it because uh, I, I actually love doing it. It's one of the best shape that you could actually be in if you could actually get on the mat and, and grapple for uh, 30, 40, 50, 60 minutes at a time. But but uh, going back to what I said, to actually understand the ground game, you actually have to get with somebody who actually understands the ground game and can show you uh, some some different things and, and what it actually truly is and means to to be in that type of situation. And uh, I, I want to relate one story. Uh, when I used to go in and train with him on Saturday mornings, it was just a $5 minimal fee. You just dropped whoever was there was there. And he actually had a, um, a student that uh, was a linebacker for the Atlanta Falcons that was in there training with him. And uh, they, uh, we were put up against each other. Of course, this guy, Steve, was way bigger than I was. Uh, but my wrestling coach had one idea in mind, and that was to take the guy down. That was to let him up, take him down again. He wanted you to win by 15 takedowns in the match. So I was pretty, pretty adept into doing takedowns. Uh, so I took this gentleman down, and... Uh, unbeknownst to me or whatever, however you want to go about doing it, uh, as I was trying to climb up the right side of his body, he actually took his right arm and put it over my back. And uh, he actually took his hand and grabbed me by my belt. And uh, I basically did a, one of those matrix moves because just with one hand, he actually lifted me up off the ground and off of him. And I was kind of dangling there by my, you know, just hanging by my belt. And I just tapped him. I said, well, there's no way in chance I'm going to do anything to you. Uh, so that was, a, that was a different experience. <laughs> but, Thank you, Jason. God bless you for sharing that. I'm going to pass this down the line before I close out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Jamie be the last to defend his position, but I'm going to go over to Mr. White real quick. And I want to say, Mr. White, thank you so much for all your input. You've looked at, and you've heard this, and what we've been talking about this, uh, the, we've been addressing these principles of motion and whatnot in, in the cross training aspect. Do you deal with much cross training at the, at the school? Uh, we really do. We have a, a, a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu instructor that teaches at our school. Uh, great guy, Marcelo Carvalho. Uh, just a really good teacher and, and does a wonderful job. The uh, training that he gives our guys has really helped us. Some of our guys are UFC fighters, uh, MMA fighters, so that education is invaluable. I always joke with him about in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, they want you to tap, and in Kempo, we want it to snap. You know, that's a big, <laughs> big difference. But, uh, yeah, it's great training. There's no question. One thing I really admire about the jiu-jitsu stylist is they're actually on the on the mat fighting, and they're working with each other. It's not all cerebral. They're not talking about uh, a lot of the intellectual aspects of karate. It's not all theory. These guys get out, and they let what they do speak for itself. So I, I really do admire that, the fact that uh, – it's more action and less talking. Thank you, Mr. White. Mr. Rabello, your thoughts real quick before we close out. Um, you first of all, uh, I wanted to uh, address it with Jamie. You know, I'm, I'm a firm believer in, uh, in the elements of jiu-jitsu. I'm very privileged to work with, like I said, people like Mr. German regarding that. I'm really seeing the incorporation of both arts. Um, also, I, I, I really am a firm believer Kenpo has never been an exclusive striking art. That's the beauty of Ed Parker's American Kenpo. Contrary, you'll hear from different sources. There's still a lot of jujitsu in Mr. Parker's system. And I think we, we should see that we're getting the best of both worlds. Um, and, uh, you know, I want to take one moment and Mr. Mr. White and those people work with Mr. Parker, we talked about relaxation. If you ever squared off with Mr. Parker, or Mr. Parker prepared to do a technique. How many people remember this? And then you watch Mr. Parker consciously like, like drop and relax and, and the importance of relaxation and the amount of speed he could generate through that relaxation and the beauty of the art. Last but not least, I was always taught that speed is acquired when learned technique becomes instinctive reflex through repetition. 
And that's what I find about the beauty of, of achieving speed through Art of Kempo. Thank you, Joseph. It's always a pleasure to have you here. Finally, I go back to you, Jamie, because I started with you. We picked on you a little bit, but you've been a good about it. Your final thoughts. Yeah, just, uh, you know what? Martial arts is, is so phenomenal. And, and American Kempo, I, I, I just view it as uh, not a pure art, not a traditional art, a modern evolving format. And that doesn't mean we need to spend considerable amount of time on the ground at the sacrifice of Kempo. I just think that, you know, it, it just makes us, helps make us more rounded in our approach and our diversity and uh, it helps us appreciate uh, what we do even more by seeing other stuff. It's like, you know, uh, it, it, when I'm not doing martial arts, I'm a sociologist, but I always appreciate, you know, disciplines of psychology or economics or, or history. I mean, yeah, those are areas that are not my specialty, but when I learn about about stuff from different disciplines, it helps me appreciate sociology more, and in this case, it helps me appreciate Kempo more. I appreciate that, and I thank everyone here. I want to close it with just one last quote from Mr. Parker, and it I think it's relative. What is this? <clears throat> it says, Kempo's true value. Kempo's true value is not in what you know, but what you do. Not what you know, but what you do. That reflects exactly what Rebello, what Jamie, what Farnsworth, Mr. White, Mr. Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Jurgen. It is truly an honor to share this with you. The goal of the Kempo Karate Hall of Fame educational video series is to educate and to bring ideas and concept and to share so that we can come together collectively as a community. I'm grateful for all your participation. I hope that the holidays are beautiful. We'll be back shortly. Until then. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Have a great Sunday. God bless everyone. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.